Hello, so this is beginning of the course titled Neutrons as Probe of Condensed Matter. Uh, this course will cover various aspects of a technique called neutron scattering for understanding structure and dynamics in condensed matter. And this course will on one hand deal with the basics of neutron scattering, on the other hand we will also familiarize you with the various techniques and various experimental facilities that are available in the country and outside the country for uh, use in neutron scattering techniques. So before I start the topic, it will be interesting to give you a very brief introduction to neutron which is a nuclear particle. Uh, neutron was predicted or rather discovered in a short letter to the editor by Chadwick uh, where he found that uh, matter should resemble that of a quantum of high energy because these experiments were done earlier also where one tried to understand a radiation coming from radium alpha beryllium sources and uh, they found that they knock out or give very large momentum to hydrogenous materials and earlier people thought like people like great scientists like Juliet Curie that this is a possibly a gamma ray but the gamma ray because uh, uh, it could knock off uh, knock uh, hydrogenous materials very efficiently that to include very large energies to the radiation. It was Chadwick who very clearly stated that if quantum, if uh, up to the present evidence is in favor of the neutron and if the conservation of energy and momentum is there then it is a mass which is close to the mass of proton and this is the elusive neutron and if he stated very politely if the conservation of energy and momentum can be relinquished then possibly you can talk about quantum hypothesis means it's a gamma radiation but we know that it was his assumption or his understanding was correct a neutron was discovered in 1932 by Shadwick in an experiment this is a spin half particle with a magnetic moment of minus 1.91 nuclear magneton and it's a nuclear particle so existing in almost every in every nucleus almost in every nucleus and uh, but uh, then after that many things happened very rapidly after discovery in 1932 in quick succession uh, people tried to bombard things with neutron and uh, in the process fission was discovered to which we know Liza Meitner, Otto Frisch, uh, Otto Hahn who got the Nobel Prize for discovery of fission they worked a lot and it was discovered that when you bombard uranium with neutron you get instead of having transuranic elements which you do get but you also get elements which are of much lower atomic number and they called it fission because the uranium nuclear nucleus giving rise to this is uh, this fission giving rise to much lower z value materials and then very quickly the first nuclear reactor was built under a baseball uh, under a basketball court at chicago university known as chicago pile and then all of us are familiar or we know the history of first nuclear explosion atom bomb uh, and the drop of atom bombs and Hiroshima and Nagasaki but we will also point out that after the discovery very quickly nuclear power plants came and also came the research reactors. So people realize quite early that neutrons can be an excellent probe why I will come to it shortly of uh, matter and research reactors like Dido in UK, NRX in Canada, Brookhaven National Laboratory they started coming up this is 1956 we had Apsara reactor in 1956 
which was a uh, uh, highly enriched uranium core reactor. We had a Cyrus reactor in, we, in 1962, which was similar to the NRX reactor at Canada. Presently, we have a reactor completely indigenously built and also instrument built by the scientist in India known as Dhruva. There's a new reactor, it's called New Apsara, which has come up in 2018. And we also have plans for a high flux research reactor or HFRR in future for use in research. Now this research is mostly done using thermal neutrons. So thermal neutrons are neutrons which are available in the core of a reactor. So in a, in a sequence actually, neutrons are produced in a fission, in a reactor, energy of the rough few million electron volts. But to keep a reactor critical, critical means the reactor will keep operating using neutrons generated in it. So it's called a critical reactor. So it's called a chain reaction, which keeps the reactor operating without any external aid. But this chain reaction is so controlled that from generation to generation, number of neutrons remain exactly same and neither they decrease nor they increase. And this is known as a critical reactor. To maintain this criticality, the reactor, uh, the neutron energy has to be brought down, uh, brought down to thermal range, thermal range, thermal range. And this is done by using something called a moderator. And the thermal energy is in the range of milli electron volts. The moderators are nothing but uh, low Z materials, mostly H2O, can be D2O, can be carbon, which through ping pong ball collision with neutron of high energy brings the neutron energy down in this inelastic collision. So neutron gives its energy to the moderator nucleus and its own energy comes down and this process goes on till the neutron temperature thermalizes at the moderator temperature and at that time we can call the neutrons as thermal neutrons and usually moderator used on H2O D2 graphite because this is a ping pong ball collision and we are familiar that when the mass of the two I mean the, the projectile and the nucleus are same then we can have maximum momentum and energy transfer so neutrons thermalize at moderator temperature and these are the neutrons known as thermal neutrons. So to show you the energy distribution, uh, this is typical Maxwellian distribution of the moderator at a, uh, of the neutron at a moderator temperature of typically say 320 Kelvin. So typically around 50 degrees centigrade. That is a typical 40 to 50 degrees centigrade is the temperature of the moderator which is present in the reactor and once it thermalizes it is not that you have a neutrons of one energy but you have an energy distribution which is Maxwellian so this is the Maxwellian distribution in this you can see there is a peak which is typically around 30 milli electron volts and we have also in this spectrum we have low energy neutrons which are actually called cold neutrons broadly below 500 milli electron volt energy. We also have hot neutrons where typically energies are more than half a electron volt or 500 milli electron volt. So there is a typical distribution of thermal neutrons and we can choose the energy of an incident neutron beam from this Maxwellian spectrum by choosing a particular energy band with the use of something called monochromators. All these I will be describing to you later, but you can take out a slice of energy from this Maxwellian for the experimental purposes. How we do it, that I will be describing later. So thermal and epithermal neutrons, typically around 1 milli electron volt to 500 milli electron volt, and this scattering is an ideal tool and possibly unique probe of microscopic structural 
dynamics and magnetic properties of condensed matter. The reason being, there are many reasons for choosing thermal neutrons for study of condensed matter. One is that the wavelength is very commensurate with the interatomic distances, which is typically around 0.1 to 10 nanometers, which is 1, ang 1 angstrom to 100 angstroms. And there are various kinds of structures we can find at this length scale. So crystallographic structure, crystallographic arrangement in a crystal, they are typically around 1 angstrom level and also um, various inhomogeneities in a bulk medium like pores in a rock or uh, uh, chemical precipitate inside another medium or a colloidal sample you have structures at around 10 nanometer or 100 angstrom length scale. Interestingly, in this respect, they are quite similar to what you have for X-rays and we have to accept that X-rays are the by far the most used tool for understanding structure in condensed matter. Mm, but uh, one advantage of neutron is that they are just as energetic as atoms and molecules in condensed matter. So their energy is also, as you saw just now, I said in milli electron volt range, and this is commensurate with various dynamical processes in condensed matter, not only solids but in liquids. So that's why I say I use the term condensed matter because, uh, like uh, phonons, they are typically around 10 to 100 milli electron volts energy range. There are inelastic uh, processes like vibrations they are typically around uh, say 500 milli electron volts there are also very slow dynamics uh, like uh, diffusion and there the energy will be typically around say hundreds of micro electron volts so one two orders of magnitude lower and for these all these kind of dynamics and their study, uh, neutrons are preferred. X-rays generally are not used for dynamic because X-ray you know that typically one angstrom X-ray will have energy of around 12 kilo electron volt. So this energy is much above the energy ranges in the condensed matter and X-rays are the basic tool for structural analysis. Another big advantage of neutrons is they get very deep into the sample. Neutron is neutral particle and it can get very deep of the order of tens of centimeters or even more. Now this is a, a property which is much better than most of the tools that we can use. X-rays, it can go to 10 to 100 microns. If you talk about electrons, they are absorbed by 30 to 40 angstrom depth. If we talk about protons, it will be even less. So, light, it will enter a medium provided the medium is transparent to light. Otherwise, it cannot enter a medium. So, in these respects, neutron can get deep into most of the samples except a few strong absorbers like uh, cadmium, gadolinium. There are some strong neutron absorbers, but apart from them, in most of the materials, neutrons can penetrate very, very deep. And so that's why we can get bulk information from use of neutrons in our experiments. Another very interesting property is that there is an extremely good contrast between isotopes and neighboring atoms in periodic table. We know in case of X-rays, the cross-section increases in a power law called Moseley's law. Z minus mu to the power 3, if I remember it correct. So neighboring, neighboring atoms in the periodic table don't have much contrast with respect to X-rays because their charge cloud is almost the same size and X-rays are scattered by the charge cloud around the atom. So nickel and copper, as an example, they are the neighboring atoms in the periodic table and there will be poor contrast. Whereas in case of neutron, the scattering takes place from the nucleus. So neutron-nuclear interaction is strong interaction and it depends 
on the first on the isotope like hydrogen or deuterium the like hydrogen coherence has a cross section negative deuterium has a cross section which is positive there is a huge contrast between hydrogen and deuterium and there are many such examples also they don't vary systematically across the periodic table because the nuclear interactions dictate what should be the scattering cross section for that particular element so one is there is very good contrast between isotopes in that respect the physics or chemistry remains same if we change one isotope with another but the structurally to neutron they provide a completely different kind of uh, contrast factor also neutron is magnetic because it has got a spin of minus 1.91 nuclear magneton and that's why for understanding magnetic structure as well as dynamics possibly neutron is the only tool which can give us microscopic view of the magnetic material also it is non destructive characterization so unlike uh, sample preparation in case of transmission electron microscope so this probe is non destructive in nature so that's all these things make neutron a very desirable tool for understanding structure and dynamics in condensed matter and countries build nuclear reactors and presently accelerator based spallation neutron sources for such studies so quick briefly i just show you that uh, this is how x ray scattering cross section changes with atomic weight but here i show the same for neutrons and you can see this is a zigzag line where first one is hydrogen and deuterium they have different values and actually hydrogen has negative scattering amplitude whereas deuterium has positive scattering amplitude so the use of hydrogen deuterium contrast is wide because we know that most of our organic and biological systems have hydrogen as a very very large component and that's why we can use the contrast between hydrogen and deuterium which i'll come to later to use them to highlight the contrast between various parts of let us say it can be a protein it can be a or a polymer molecule and use the study to understand not only the whole material but a part of the molecule or a part of the protein similarly there is also negative uh, scattering cross section for nickel which is nickel 62 which is different from nickel 58 so this is uh, typically a uh, nature of uh, scattering cross section of or scattering amplitude for neutrons as a function of atomic weight this is for thermal neutrons and this is for x rays so compared to x rays this is also a desirable property for neutrons i'll stop and then i'll take you for the neutron sources in the next part